classes on how to prepare your landscape, plants in the yard, the, the, your containers, your raised beds for uh, the fall and winter seasons, and what should you do to get them ready. Uh, if you're new to the area, we do this all the time. It gets cold, and then it warms back up. Indian summer is what they call it. So it's, it gets warm, and then, it, then all of a sudden it gets cold again. So this week it'll get cold, and it'll get warm. So we kind of slowly get cold to the end of the year. And so the fall color is in full swing right now. And that will happen. So you're, right now it's the maples are in full red. Uh, you're seeing the uh, flame maples are already done. They've already been in color, and they are bare. They're always the first ones. Sumacs are kind of, they've already been in color for a month, and now they're, they're done. They're just done. Uh, it will end up about Thanksgiving, the first part of December. The very last tree to turn red in the fall of the year is the Bradford pears, or your ornamental pears. So and then after that point, it's officially winter. That's when your evergreens have got to carry you to get through. So your landscape should be designed 20% uh, landscape, 20% uh, evergreens in the landscape, 20% spring bloomers, 20% summer bloomers, 20% fall color. And those of you that this is your summer home, for you, you're heading back to the valley, I wouldn't focus on evergreens. I would focus, because you're not here. I'd focus on spring bloomers or summer bloomers. When you're here, focus on that. So it looks good when you're, so that last 20% whatever makes, whatever tickles your fancy as a gardener, do that. So you want that balance so that as these seasonalities change, you've always got something interesting going on. Another thing you'll find, and this is really a hard concept for you folks from the Midwest to can't capture, uh, we don't have soil. We just don't. If there's no food, no nutrients, there's nothing but caliche, rocks, granite, clay, gunk in the soil. So what you'll find is you have to fertilize more often. This is the number one mistake I find people make, especially in the fall of the year. You need to fertilize about October, sometime in October, around Halloween. So now through Thanksgiving, you should fertilize everything in the yard. If you don't, and you can walk through your neighborhood and watch this, you'll just see in your neighbors, you can tell who didn't fertilize and who did. Because those evergreens, the Deodor cedars, the spruce, the pine, they just turn yellow. They get winter chlorosis is what we call it. And so they just become starved. And all their, they've been on this water diet for a year and a half and they're just, with the short days and the cold nights, they just turn yellow. If you fertilize them in the fall of the year, they stay green, just like that. If you want spring bloomers, that is lilacs, forsythia, roses next year, if you want flowering quince, crab apples, any fruit trees, anything that blooms or fruits in the spring, it needs to be fertilized now because it's going to use this fertilizer to create next spring's flower buds, leaf buds. It's using this to, for next spring. So everyone gets that backwards of thinking, oh, it's starting this spring now, I'll fertilize now, and it's too late. At that point, it's either formed its buds or it hasn't. You might be able to encourage some leaf size or few release, but it's, it's, it's doing it right now. They're already forming leaf buds. You look at your trees, your, 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 your shrubs, they've already got next spring's leaf buds on. Mm. Yep. Uh, the fertilizer stakes versus the granular? So, good question. That happens, that comes up often. A couple things. Um, there is no food in our soil. So stakes are great. They last for a year. That's great. The problem with stakes, and the reason we no longer sell them here, is that you don't know where the roots are. You don't know where to put the stakes. And unless you're putting you know, three dozen of them out there and underneath the tree, you just, it's fertilizing this whole area, but is that where it needs to be? You just don't know. Because there's no real nutrients in the soil, you need to be more even more consistent. So we've made our own fertilizers. Uh, just a quick lesson. This is all-purpose plant food. We've had this one. I put this together probably 15 years ago or more. It's nat all natural, so it's not going to hurt your pets and birds, that kind of stuff. The main ingredient is cottonseed meal, bird guano. It's got some iron, some sulfur, that kind of stuff. So this you sprinkle on the ground, on top of the rock, and let winter rains and snow do its work. It'll just break down slowly. 
that's hard for you gardeners. So for you gardeners, I'll just allow you, you can work it in and really go rake it around and really make, make work out of it. Me, I just chuck it and I walk away and I go. And it just, it'll do its work. So this is what you want to use on most of the landscape, especially evergreens. This is the one because that, the uh, cottonseed meal is real acidic, so it'll make the soil more acidic when we add, added some soil. Uh, fruit trees have become a big thing. It's amazing how many edible you know, grapes, berries, fruit trees. Uh, so we made a fruit tree food. It's fruit and vegetable fruit food. So if you've got fruit trees or things that bloom in the spring, this is a better formula for it. The reason being, it's got uh, it's all organic, and then it's, we we dosed it basically with we doped it with uh, gypsum. Gypsum is a calcium is a calcium source. If you add calcium to plants, uh, it makes the fruit larger, sweeter, tastier. It'll make the tomatoes just taste better. So gypsum is a calcium source we put in just for edible stuff. So for my yard, I put, I put two bags of this down last weekend and a bag of this, because I've got some fruit trees. And just anything that blows, I gave it that. Everything else, I use the all-purpose food, okay? So that's the difference between steaks, not steaks. The great thing about organics, too, is uh, you're not gonna poison yourself. If you're on a well, if you put chemicals, petroleum-based chemicals, like Scott's Trip Build or whatever, that's very water soluble. It is possible to get that into your water source. And the way that we feel responsible, I want to sell like four truckloads of fertilizer. I don't know how many tons that is, but it's a lot. Um, I can personally poison the whole community if I sold the wrong thing. So I don't, I don't, I feel responsible not to sell petroleum based products. I sell organics because they break down slower. The plants take up all the nutrients instead of a portion of it. Instead of a 10 10 10, where half of the 10 10 10 is wasted, his water soluble flows down. The next rain that we get gets, gets flushed down the rain, the uh, uh, dry wash that you've got or whatever. Uh, this gets broken down and the plant uses all of it. That's, that's how you use fertilizers. Before I, before I take a question, I got to cover the miracle growth thing water solubles. So we do make a water soluble. Don't use these in the fall on the landscape. These are mixed up in watering cans. It's diluted in water, and you water in your plants with this. This we made for containers, raised beds, flowering things, house plants. This is our food. It's amazing how well it works. But it, it flushes, again, it's water soluble, so it goes through the soil too fast for a big tree or evergreen or, or lilac to pick up. So don't, don't use your water solubles out, out in the landscape. You want to use granulars. And I would suggest use organics, organic fertilizers, okay? With that, now we can take a question, because I think I got the uh, fertilizer question answered, right? Okay? Yeah. I've been using 744 a long time, and I got some new um, grass put in, some new saw put in. Can I use that, or do you have something um, specific? Great question. So the 744, the all-purpose, the best lawn food oh. you've ever seen. It will be amazing. I mean, because the bird went out, the manure's in there. Um, it greens up a lawn. Do I need to use a starter first? So it's a brand new lawn? It's sawed, yeah. If it's a brand new, this, this is, because it's all, it's, it's organic, it's going to break down slow enough, you're not going to burn. It's a good starter fertilizer as well. Anytime we plant for you, if we were coming out to plant, or, or any, in our planting guide, we always say add some of this to every planting, a tree, a shrub, a lawn, whatever. I'm going to plant some wild flower, a, a meadow, Wildflower Meadow today, this afternoon. Um, by seed, I'm going to put this and some humic is what I'm going to do. Those are the two things. Didn't really want to cover that today, but we can sidebar meeting. But humic is, makes things root fast. Yeah. And then the food makes it green up. Okay. So the number one thing is fertilize. I can't emphasize that one enough. And do it before Thanksgiving or before you head back down to the valley. It's, it's a good time to fertilize now. Okay. Uh, if you're thinking holidays, you fertilize Halloween, Easter, 4th of July, because that's when the rains come, um, and then the New Year's, especially for evergreens. They really benefit. Uh, you only get one shot of growth with pine, spruce. They get one candle growth, one bit of growth a year, and that's, that's it. Whatever you get through that year, that, that's all you get. If you can maximize that, you get richer, deeper, better evergreens.
But haven't you said the deciduous omit the, the New Year's? Deciduous doesn't matter as much. Although if you've had trouble, one thing I hear a lot, especially when the lilacs bloom, my lilacs bloom for the last couple of years really well and it didn't bloom last year. Why? I mean, I, I had a nickel for every time I heard that question. Um, it's always because of nutrients. They didn't fertilize enough. The plant used up all the, they probably planted it with mulch food and they got it all, they, they took care of that when they planted it and then it's used all that up in a couple of years and now it's, doesn't have enough food to form a flower bud. There I would definitely, if you want things to bloom. In fact, here's an insider tip. For my own gardens, this probably is not a handout that will come to you. In fact, Ken, do we have that clipboard to get that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, this is, so here's the, here's the handout. We're going over the, all the, you'll have this in your inbox. This is a doc file, so anyone can open it up with any kind of device. Um, this, will, this is coming to you. But one thing that's not on here, what I do for myself, I'll take super phosphate and things that I really want blooms. Like I've got Russian sage that are over the top. I mean, they're just, they're ridiculously blue. And in front of those, I step down into autumn sage. It's ridiculous how many flowers. This thing has no foliage. It's all flowers. It's crazy. And every neighbor that goes by goes, wow, that's pretty neat. Uh, and how I do it is I put the, the all-purpose plant food on it. In addition, I give it super phosphate. I I brought, yeah, I did. Super, I'll throw a super phosphate on it. This is 0180. It's all phosphorus. So I'm front loading uh, the plant with, with phosphorus. Phosphorus, that middle number, that's what brings out flowers, flowers and blooms. So if you've had something that struggled or you just want it to be prettier than all your neighbors, you should give it some of this. This is kind of like a, it's not a true food, it's kind of like a Snickers bar for, for plants. So it's like, hypes them up, who are the ones just want to bloom, but the steak and potatoes is going to be your, your regular all-purpose plant food. That's a, kind of a little insider tip. And then lastly, if you've got blue spruce, I know we had someone with a blue spruce, if you have those really rich blue evergreens, you want them to really come out with that silvery blue, uh, that's using an aluminum. Uh, mineral that they pick up to create that blue. If you want to make it, make your evergreen specifically more blue, aluminum sulfate, this is the time that you do it for spring growth next spring. You put some aluminum sulfate on that, a couple of handfuls for a big tree. They'll pick that aluminum up and you'll have a bluer, uh, silvery blue tree. Does anyway. a, a tree have to be in the ground for a year before you start fertilizing no. it? No, do it. Uh, well, okay. As long as you're shopping at Waters Garden Center, no, you do not have to wait a year. If you're using uh, uh, heavy chemical stuff, things that fat, we've all made a mistake by burning plants yeah. with the wrong fertilizer. Those are usually chemicals, and they're 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 releasing too fast, high nitrogen source. With the benefit of organics, they really they release much slower over a longer period of time. So you, you're not going to burn with them. So go ahead. For, I encourage. Well, I was going to put the 744 because I'm Absolutely. getting ready to do the Halloween, ha Absolutely. Halloween feeding. Yep. But you're saying to add the other. Should I wait until? No, stuff? do it at the same time. While you're out doing it, just there's not one before the other. Just just do it. It doesn't so matter. So this other is not organic, like. No, it, so. these are these are a mineral, so it's aluminum. That's in fact, if you take a blue spruce, kind of try it. Wipe the, wipe the needles, you can actually wipe the blue off the tree. That's why the inside of a blue spruce is generally green, and the tips, the new growth, is bluer. It's just a secretion that the plant throws off that coats that needle, and it's aluminum that does that. It's kind of an insider. Too much trivia, sorry. I could go on and on for days. Yeah. I have the uh, juniper that it's on a berm coming down. The covering one. Yeah. And the, the tips of some of mine now are kind of turning brown. I don't know if that's that yellow you were talking about. Yeah. Brown is not good. Do I just trim those off? Yeah. It's probably tip burn. Something happened at the soil, soil level. I don't know what it is. I mean, it could be. I can narrow it down to about 20 things. Right. Most likely uh, grubs, gophers, something's eating the roots, cutworms, that kind of stuff. Or we just missed a, a watering back in summer. Got a little bit dry, so the tips burned off. 
80% of all issues are water over or under. So it could be that, just a little damage. I'd clip it off, fertilize it, set the stage for next spring, and it'll come out. It'll How do you get rid of rubs if you might have them? Let's, well, I'm glad that you, you covered that. So that's good. So we're going to do that. So in my yard, I get grubs. There's a certain part of my yard I've got a dry wash it goes through. It's underneath a juniper, a giant juniper tree. And the grubs, the beetles, lay their eggs underneath that tree. And then I get grubs almost every year in that, in that part of the garden. They start eating my plants. Grubs are those white C-shaped worms. Look at things. They look like an alien life form. You want to suck on your jugular vein or something. I mean, some of them are four or five inches long. Green. Or they can be cute little oh, things. Oh, no, not green. They're not green. They're white. That's tomato worms. Oh, yeah, those, those are impressive too. <laughs> yeah, they spit at you. Oh, yeah. They're not that big. Uh, we did. No we have, way. Yes, we yes. did. Two of them. You've got a record. That's your I have pictures of it. Yeah, it was. It was chasing the dog in our backyard. <laughs> <laughs> when you pick those tomato worms off, oh, I didn't um, touch it. <laughs> they'll actually spit at you. They'll actually spit. Regurgitate at you. It's kind of gross. I used to pick them off the tomatoes and I'd give them to the boys, <laughs> going, Here, boys, make sure these are all dead when you get done with them. They go, Oh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> so they go speed the bird or whatever. You know, trivia. Also, when that bug eats tobacco, it turns blue instead of green. <laughs> Plant trivia today. There we go. Uh, same bug as uh, Sphinx moth, that big moth that looks like a hummingbird. Oh, yeah. That's what that caterpillar turns into. So whenever you see her buzzing around, she's pollinating your plants. She's also laying eggs on your peppers and your tomatoes. So. What about the one I think, well, at least I found it on my grapevine. It's never seen anything like it in my life. It was a big, ugly thing. Well, okay. I don't know. Okay. So I'm not sure. Okay. So she had she had a, something similar on a grape. There's so many things you can eat grapes. Usually it's spittle bugs, and there's a little caterpillar. There's a caterpillar that likes grapes specifically. It have red, black, I can't remember. It was last yellow year. or black stripes. I'm waiting for them this year. Oh. Yeah, ours had yellow and black stripes. Yeah, that's a that's a great leaf skeletonizer. Really easy to kill. When you see it, just get rid of it. Um, Ken, can I ask you just yeah. backtrack a minute? For the Alberta spruce, do I need the aluminum phosphate? No, aluminum no. sulfur? No, no, the super phosphate. Just, just the, I wouldn't even do for evergreens. That's an Alberta spruce is a cute little yeah. green evergreen. I don't think it needs aluminum. Wouldn't hurt it, but it's not going to help it either. Uh, I would just use for that the all-purpose plant food. That's it. It's really simple. So I'm getting, I'm complicating it a little bit. In fact, what I'll do, um, Ken, if you could remind me, let's send this handout and then I'll, I'll give the fertilizer uh, handout. It's the four, four steps of feeding. We can get those two things to you that will explain a lot of this. Kind of simplify it. Yeah. Roses. Come on, our roses. Okay. Yep. So he's got roses, and they have some powdery gray, white stuff on the leaves. Just powdery mildew, very common, um, especially this time of year. Uh, what to do? Um, pretty much the plants shutting down now. I mean, roses actually can keep growing until through Thanksgiving or so, until the first part of December, and they'll kind of lock in place. They'll defoliate pretty much. For you, it's going to be really important to clean up all those leaves that drop and throw them away. Don't compost them. Get them off your property, because that spore can come back and come right back onto the rose again next year. And then spray it with revitalize. There you go, revitalize. That's good to help. And then with roses, we just cover pruning real quick and then we'll go back to grubs. Just trying to get there. Pruning, you do not want to prune yet. Don't prune. Wait. You want to wait till after the new year. Uh, so folks from Southern Cal, Phoenix, Palm Springs, they want to prune way too early. So what happens is if you prune your roses back or your autumn sage or some of your perennials and you'll prune them back and now they don't have all that foliage to protect them to insulate them so if we do have a harsh winter it'll kill the plant it's better to wait till after the new year I'll, I'll wait until usually into February March I mean things are starting to grow I mean the daffodils are in bloom that's my cue going okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna prune it so I kind of take it over several weekends I take my time 
cut back the perennials, but don't don't get in a hurry to prune back, especially roses. Roses should be pruned in March, period. March is your time for roses, okay? Grubs, got that lower area for grubs. I know I'm going to have grubs, it just, it's like the perfect environment for grubs. So when I'm putting my fall fertilizer down, I put grub killer right here. While I'm fertilizing, I just spread around the yard where I've got grubs. If you know you're gonna have them. Another cue for grubs, if you've got javelina coming in and digging up your yard, they're always after grubs. They're, they're, they're after, that's their protein source. Worms, grubs. I would do that area, get rid of the food source, and the, uh, the grubs are, the javelina are less likely to come in and, and eat your, dig up your yard, rototill your yard. Uh, skunks. Uh, we have had quite a few customers come in, they, they dig this perfect little cone-shaped hole in the yard. That's always a skunk. Only one thing does that, skunks. And they got a, such a great nose, they actually can smell where the grub is. They take their little hands and go, and they eat the grub. So if you see that in that part there, you've got grubs, just put grub killer down. You'll get rid of your skunks, and you'll get rid of your grubs all at the same time. You can so put that's, it in raised beds? You can use it in raised beds. Uh, it's just not, it's not organic. So I don't, I don't use this in my, my vegetable areas for me. Um, I use it out in just the rear of the landscape is what I do, okay? Another thing I do, um, I put weed and grass preventer down. I hate weeding. There are two things I actually despise about gardening. Uh, and I'm saying this as a garden center owner, but we're friends, right? We're just neighbors talking across the fence. Here's what I don't like. I don't like weeds and I don't like watering. Those are two things that are just laborious. And so I put weed and grass preventer, weed and grass stoppers down. They actually make products. Turf and ornamental weed and grass stopper. It keeps the seed from germinating. What you're going to have is after this next cold front, all your summer things, summer weeds are going to die. So the tumbleweeds will be vaporized. The whorehound will start to, the goat heads, all those summer insidious summer weeds are going to get burned off because they don't like winter. So they don't like to go below freezing. But there's some weeds like dandelions love winter. Uh, uh, foxtail, it's beautiful little grass that puts on the seed head that's, that just wants to go through your sock, through your ankle, and out the other side. That's always a winter weed, and it only comes back by a seed. It's an annual. It only comes back by seed. And so if you could put your weed and grass stoppers down, especially where you have lots of weeds seem to show up, those certain flower beds that have lots of weeds, or certain areas in your yard are more weedy than others, put that down, and it will eliminate 95% of all weeds. Just, it's, it'll get rid of all the work. I mean, a bag covers 5,000 square feet. That's a lot for, for, for something. Only negative, it's not, it's not organic. But if you've got weeds coming up in your rock lawn and that's driving you crazy, this will keep the weeds from coming up. And the time is now. Time is now, absolutely time is now. Um, These are all things you do in the fall. In the fall is when you want to get all this stuff done. Yeah? Um, I got a puppy and I have been putting that out in my gravel area. And now I've got it fenced in for dogs. Since it's not organic, it's still going to be okay for What them. I do with the dogs in the dog areas, because um, we've got dogs, if I ever hurt the dogs, divorce is for sure. It just, it's just going to happen. Uh, hurt a kid, not a problem. Dogs, it's an issue. And so for my dogs, what I do in the dog areas, dog runs, I'll actually water it in. I'll just take a hose and I'll activate it. It goes in the ground and you're fine. But they dig and they play hard. And I, I think I've okay. never had a real, I mean, I've got a schnauzer. They're, they're cute as can be. They dig, they're diggers. I had a Scotty before that, they're diggers. So I just water it in. I've also been, I'm that weird neighbor that's out there in a snowstorm or a rainstorm, fertilizing, putting this kind of stuff. I'm taking advantage of the moisture that's coming down. So I'm out there working, getting all this stuff down that activates it getting the ground. Same with grub killer. I'll put that down, I'll hose it in so it gets in the ground, and then it activates it and it starts to do its job. You want to get those these things down early. Uh, what happens is the gophers and the grubs are very active right now. They are eating ferociously. As soon as that soil gets down to about 40 degrees, they go down real deep and they hibernate about four feet down under the ground. And you don't see them thinking, oh, no grubs, everything's good. 
and then as soon as this, the ground warms up, they come right back up, start eating those new spring flowers you've got out, or new tree you just put out. I've seen an eight-year-old locust fall over the wind because of growths. It can be serious. You don't want to take it lightly. You want to be active on it. Right now, what I'm finding in my own yards, I've got voles. It's almost every day I'm catching a, a field mouse, what it is. They're coming in and they're trying to, they're finding places where they're going to hibernate or nest in your furniture pads or your built-in grill or your garage. They're looking for warm spots to be out of the cold. Well, I don't want that. I've got, I've had pack rats eat holes from my hot tub. I mean, they're just insidious. You just don't want that. So you want to keep on it, watch after that, and uh, don't take it for granted, okay? All right, uh, some bugs, what to look for. Right now, you, you're going to see, as soon as we get our first hard freeze, that's when you see aphids show up. Aphids will be on, they'll start showing up on aspens, apples, pine trees, especially Austrian pine, ponderosa pines. So just look for them, and, and the cue will be, You'll see underneath those plants, it'll have this glistening, almost looks like it's moist underneath. If you park underneath a, a big pine tree, you'll have these little spots all over your paint. That's always aphids up in the tree. Be aware, they show up in the fall. This is their time. This is when they shine. Uh, and they'll be here through the end of the year, so they don't get, the cold doesn't, it makes them more robust, doesn't make them, it makes them, they like the cold. And so what to do, um, multi-purpose insect spray, obliterates them, takes them right out. I put them in a hose and sprayer and I just hose stuff down. So multi-purpose insect spray is, is what you use for aphids. Uh, what else comes out this time of year? That's the main one that really is, can really become bad depending how, how long fall is for us. So that's something to watch. Also, uh, weeds. You might as well put the Roundup away, all those glyphosates. They do not work starting now. Don't even waste your time, energy, or money. A Roundup product is not going to work when the nighttime temperatures are down to below 45. So you got to switch uh, products. And so we've got some organics called Burnout. This does work when the nights are cold. So you want to switch up your, your, uh, your weed killers, just if that's a thing for you. Okay? Just some things to watch. Um, another thing that's showing up right now is while we're on bugs, uh, you're bringing plants indoors, we're getting this wave of customers coming in with little tiny gnats inside their house. Little black gnats are called fungus gnats. Very common, they show up this time of year through the end of the year. Uh, what we're suggesting is systemic granules. Um, put that on the plant, it'll go through the soil, kill off, it's a maggot that lives in the soil. Okay. You kill the maggot, uh, the flies don't come back at you. Um, so I'm going to bring a huge fern inside this weekend. It's magnificent. It's just a, this beautiful fern is going to get frosted next week. So I want to save this. I'm going to bring it into our family room. I'm going to clean it up, sprinkle some of this on, because it's amazing what lives in the soil. Before you bring that thing indoors and you bring all the earwigs and pill bugs and spiders and stuff in, I treat the soil with this just to get rid of all that stuff. Then I bring it indoors. Just this is what I do. And it would probably work for you too. Mainly, watch for for little gnats. They show up now. Uh, and they'll be in, inside of houseplants, basically. Okay. Bless you. What else? Oh, if you have pine trees, especially ponderosa and pinyon pines, these two. So ponderosa pines, they get ips beetle or bark beetle. So that's the beetle that goes in. It eats a cambium layer. It actually girdles a tree. It kills a tree. Uh, some of you have some magnificent ponderosas. I mean, you, if they die, you can, they're not replaceable. They're invaluable. Uh, that huge ponderosa pine. Just give it a sec. They're backing up the bobcat. Oh, uh, so you're going to move it? Mess of course, the oh, they're picking it up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can't stall that long. Yeah, I can. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, pinion pines, they get scale on them. There's a scale that comes out in spring. And they can also get bark beetle, too. Uh, for the pine trees, what I really recommend, those things, especially the ones that are really valuable. Some of you have big acreage, you've got lots of pines. I don't do them all. I do the big ones, the most valuable ones, the ones that screen off the neighbors, the ones that, they're so you know which ones you want to keep alive. Uh, and the old guys, ones that have been around for 100 years, 
they're the ones that are most susceptible to bark beetle and scale. I treat it with uh, this uh, tree and shrub plant protector. It's a liquid, mix up with a watering can. You pour it right at the base of the tree. It'll take it up, taints the, the uh, sap. And so it kills off the bark beetles that are eating the, the wood underneath. And then it taints the, the tips of the new growth uh, for scale that comes out next spring. So some of you don't have pines, it's not a big deal. If you got those natives, this is a this is this will keep them healthy. When you put that on now? Now, yeah, yeah right now. Yeah, Absolutely okay. right now. Yeah, right away. I could lose one. I, yeah. It was gorgeous. So, so it's, common. It's such I wish I knew about that before. I've seen entire streets, I mean every tree dead, except for the ones that had this on it. And they're really slow growers, yeah. like a foot in ten years or something. Yeah. 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 And that's all my bug. I've tried to cover all the avenues, different not not everything it pertains to everyone, but if it, if it worked for you, if that's that hit a nerve, talk later, we can show you what to do. Yes. Um, speaking of aphids, have them or have roses, would you spray now for potential? No, roses? I would, yeah, good, good question. That's actually pretty good. So can you spray roses specifically or, or anything what as a preventative for, for aphids? Would you do yuccas too? Uh, I would. I don't. I'm not a big advocate for spraying just to spray. Yeah. Uh, even organics are dangerous. They kill things. You just want to be. You want to use them responsibly. And so I really don't use. I, I'll, I'll spray when I see an issue. So aphids can get on yuccas and get on agaves. It's unusual, but they, I've seen it many times. So when you see that, spray them. But just as preventative, probably not. What well, I would. Know. Spider mites. If you had a problem last year, wait. I'd still, I would just wait till I see it. Spider mites come out. Uh, you can always see the webbing. They like the evergreens. You'll see that webbing inside. You can't see the bug. It's just the indication, the symptom. It's webbing. When you see that, just spray it with a multi-purpose insect spray. That'll. Look. But they come out in the summer. You're done with spider mites now. So it's, as we get cold, they just go. I'm done. And they'll hibernate underground or something. So I wouldn't really. Don't go. Don't go. I'm trying to get what my grandparents used to do. They'd mark the calendar and every two weeks. They would spray with, with like DDT or some, <laughs> some heavy chemical. I think we can be more strategic. With it. We can definitely be more environmentally, more organics. We can do all that. Okay, great question. Okay, yes. Jody would like to know, can you plant a Dura birch right now? They lost theirs in the monsoon. Gotcha, yeah, Dura birch. This is a very good time, good question, very good time to plant trees, especially larger trees uh, like birch, aspens, uh, fruit trees like apples, pears, peaches, apricots, uh, shade trees like maples. This is the time, this is the most popular time to plant maples because they're so pretty and people go, oh, I want one of those. And so we load up with them. Here's a secret if you're planting trees, especially larger things now, you, you want to make sure you water those through winter. So we'll, we'll tie this into the irrigation question that came up. So you're gonna turn those irrigation systems off. If you've got landscapers or gardeners, you're going through right now and deactivating uh, uh, irrigation systems. Usually the month of November, we start to power those things down. You cannot plant a birch, a pine tree, a spruce. Now, water it once turn your irrigation off and never water it again until next April. That's not going to live. That's not going to go well for you. You'll need to hand water that a couple times a month. Just pick a nice day and hand soak it. Um, so that would be the only caveat. Can I plant now? Yes, it's an absolutely great time to plant as long as you're keeping it hydrated through winter. We can have dry spells where we don't see moisture, a bit of moisture, for two months. And then we'll get a snow, it's maybe an inch deep. We're thinking, oh, that's enough moisture to keep things going. The, the math is seven inches of snow equals one inch of rain. So it takes a lot of moisture, a lot of powder and snow to, to, to do anything in the yard for your, for your landscape. So you, I'd suggest even with the snow, water by hand. Those new things that you wanna really get through so spring takes off, okay? Anything else? So I think I'm getting close. Let me just make sure. Are you going to, is the 
Is that the irrigation talk? Oh. So, yeah, that's basically it. You're going to turn off irrigation in November. You want to water twice a month. Everything. Yep. Okay. That's what I want. Uh, maybe flowers a little bit more. I'll, I'll probably water my, I have a lot of pansies, snapdragons. I've got beets when the kids come home, the grandkids come in at the holidays. They love going out with pops and picking stuff. They love to pick things. So they're going to come in, they're going to ask me, what can we go pick? Pop, pop, I mean, it's, let's go. And so I've got beets, lettuce, spinach, and we'll go out, we'll just pick the, you know, but there's nothing, just magical. Pulling a beet out of a, out of the ground, going, look, we could go and eat this. Going, no, just want to pick it. I don't want to eat it. I just want to pick it. So I'll have that for them. And that's good for us. We do kales, you know, we like juicing kales and stuff. Those are things that like the winter. They like the flavor comes out better uh, when it's cold. So your tomatoes are going to be gone next week. Uh, you better watch, be careful, either protect, cover them, protect them, or pick the fruit and have them ripen up inside. But it looks like we're getting a little cold snapper. It's going down to the high 20s. And that, that's, uh, that'll, that'll take out most of the summer flowers, vegetables, that kind of stuff. Uh, my my uh, flowering stuff, I'll water maybe every 10 days or so in winter. So right now I'm watering about every five days, four to five, somewhere in there. I'm letting, the great thing is with pansies, that's these guys right here. Pansies are truly a canary in the coal mine. They will tell you when they're dry. They are just big crybabies. They whine and complain with every little, ch if it gets below freezing, they lay on the ground. They go, I'm cold. The sun comes up, they perk right up going, okay, I'm happy. When they're dry, they lay down. They just go, I'm it. I'm, I'm, if you don't water me the next day, I'm going to die on you. And then you water them, they go, okay, I'm okay. So they're a great indicator to tell you in the winter, when should I water? So I, I'll use this and I'll watch it. You're reading your plants, they're talking to you. If you're just out there listening, and they'll tell you when to water. More so than a snapdragon, this guy, I plant a lot of snapdragons. There's a couple of them. Every yard should have a snapdragon. Every yard. Um, this one is great to be planted in the fall. And what will happen is this will bloom through Thanksgiving almost to, to Christmas. And then it'll stop blooming. It just gets too cold. And I'll prune off these seed heads. And by then it's got this long stem. It's been blooming for months. I'll cut the stem off and I'll keep this green foliage on. It'll stay green right through winter. I'll fertilize this again with this uh, uh, flower power, this water soluble food. I'll fertilize it again as soon as I feel the weather's breaking. Usually it's about Valentine's, middle of February into February. I'll fertilize it. This thing will start taking off again and blooming right through June. It's an amazing little plant. The great thing about this, it looks delicious, but rabbits, javelina, deer, they do not eat these. I don't know why. I mean, I want to add some ranch dressing and have some, but they don't like it. So it's a great little plant and it reseeds, it comes back. It's kind of like a wildflower. So it's a great little plant for your. In fact, I put this together for you. So this is a dogwood. It's been in color, just, just, it just lost it all, all its leaves. But the stems are so beautiful that I'll use these in pots. Then when you put lighter colors underneath them, like gray, dusty miller, that just looks fabulous in a container, right, right by the front door, even without foliage. But yeah, it's got the little white flowers in spring. It's got great variegated foliage through the season. This is pretty any time of the year. It's a, it's a red twig dogwood. Your coral bark maples, all those red, interesting, uh, uh, barky kind of plants. Uh, right now, the uh, uh, burning bush is in red. It's a beautiful red, that's why people plant it, but I think it has more interest because when you look at the bark, it's got this cork bark to it. It's kind of square. It's very interesting, very geometric and beautiful. I'll use it in displays for the, without the foliage. And then I'll underplant it with some pretty plants. You can do that too. It's a good time to decorate uh, your plants, your, your, your yard. Uh, I, just, I just did the uh, pots for the Chambers of Commerce. Some of the big chambers, small business owners get together helping each other. So I do the flowers out front. They had pumpkins sitting there on the ground where no one saw them. I went, I'm gonna help you with this. I just put the pumpkin in the pot, dressed it up with a whole bunch of flowering things, and they're going, oh, that looks so good. This is a decorating time of, of year. So the uh, porch pot, 
event that we've got coming up in a couple of weeks. That's make a, make a container, but then accessorize it. We're gonna have some accessories. You can put some spray painted pine cones and some picks you can throw in there to make it holiday-ish. If you love turkeys, put turkey, put a turkey in there. Dress it up with, if you like uh, Halloween, put a scarecrow in there. If you like Christmas, put little Christmas lights and bows on it. So we'll, we'll go over how to do that with a living thing, but accessorize it with the holiday theme. This guy here, anyone know what those are? Violas, yeah, very good. Or Johnny Jump Ups, the old, old name. This is basically a pansy. It's just a small one. These I find are even hardier in my yard. Uh, they, they bloom longer and they can also reseed sometimes. So they come back stronger. Whereas the mammoth pansies, they're more popular. Uh, but by summer, by June, they don't, like, they don't like to be hot. They just, I don't care how much water you give them in the month of June, they lay over and die. These guys keep going. So I've got some of these that are several years old and they're still going pretty strong. And so this is one you plant now and it gives you some color, especially strategically. It's gonna get cold. The days are gonna become very short. And so it's just dark and dreary out. And it's like 32. I want something where I can look out the, the windows and sip my coffee and go, ah, my gardens are still going. Not all the gardens, but I've got some color strategically uh, in my yard. Do you uh, deadhead those? Because last year I put them in baskets and oh my gosh, I'm out there just put like, there's so many. So now this year I bought the big ones. Yeah. Yeah, you do not need to deadhead. Well, these these self to? deadhead. Yeah, oh, you don't have to do I it. I wish I knew that. It might drive gardeners crazy though because they'll go, oh, there's a spent flower. I, I must deadhead. You don't have to though. It will set another flower all by itself. Can you talk about that stock? Yeah, yeah. yeah you bet. You all are good. This is a good class. Stock. This is one that you plant, pass that around. That just smells so, just take a whiff of that. It smells so, it's better than a lilac, I think. It's just so well, I fragrant. I like them at the front door. This one I like in containers. So it raises, in the ground is pretty, but in containers it raises it up where now the stock is up here where you can enjoy it better, where it brings it up, the fragrance up better, so you can enjoy it better. But by the front door, by that bedroom window that you like to keep open, even when it's January, my wife is crazy. I'm freezing to death under the electric blanket. She's got the doors, windows wide open. Um, so put them there where you can you can enjoy them. That one too, I noticed in my javelina. Yeah. They don't eat that. They, they leave it alone. It's got that texture where they just don't like it. They go for the pansies. They do, and they love this one. This is the this is a this is one of my favorite fall winter plants. This is ornamental kale. It's actually like a cabbage, but it's, oh. it's, it's, uh, it's not edible. It's just nasty tasting, uh, but it's pretty. These they use in front of uh, stock. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'd come up with a better name than stock. I mean, but <laughs> we, we have a question about that. So can you kind about of repeat stock? what you said? Yes. Yes. What's the question? The question is, what was it called? Stock. And it smells nice, right? Uh, you wish you were here. <laughs> <laughs> this, we planted the front of hotels, uh, major commercial where people are coming and going, because uh, it's so bright for so long. And then usually sometime in April, May, depending on the season, it'll start to elongate, and then it gets this real pretty yellow flower to it that's very fragrant as well. So we like to put those in where it, so it brings out the fragrance as you're coming up and down uh, you'll see this in your commercial settings. You'll see ornamental kale. This one does really well when it's snowy. The highest element of the ridge lines, the Broom Creek, Highland Pines, this one's going to do great. Just don't put it where the javelina can find it because they think they've died and gone to heaven. They will jump, climb stairs, go up ladders to go after this. So I put it out where those animals can't get to it. Is that an animal? This is an annual, yeah. Sometimes after it elongates, you can cut it off. And you'll see pups coming out. It can go several years, but it's, then you got two or three of these instead of one. That's just pretty. Two little ones, I don't know, it's not the same. What else I got? Moms, let me show you this one. Look at this. You see what we did? Yeah. Put two colors in the same pot. Con contrasting moms. This is actually a garden mom. It's made to 
go in the ground. This would come back. You plant this in the ground. This will actually turn out to be this big next year. It'll double in size. So you can go with this. I mean, these are just $3.99. These are probably 30 or 40 bucks, however much they are. $39.99. But this is just like gorgeous by the front door. So we'll put a, we'll pop a few of these down. Then I'll go plant it out in the yard later and, and enjoy it. For um, years how to come. long can you uh, expect them to it's keep heavy. coming back? So that'll come back for eternity, I mean, for, for a long time. It's truly a perennial. Because I had one that size or smaller last year. Dallas is all yellow. It's huge. The monsoons came. They're all down like this. I got stakes. Oh, they got too wet. The, well, they were just <laughs> huge. And I thought, well, what's going to happen next year? It'll be fine. Don't water it as much. So it got too wet. It was drunk. And it just fell down the garden. Oh, I thought, I thought that was the so weight. Much. I thought that was the weight that smashed them. I down. think you. I think you need to water it less frequently, and I think it'll it'll stay perky and upright yeah. better, and stubbier. So, um, garden moms. There's two kinds of moms that you'll find. Some of them are greenhouse grown. Probably for gardeners, you all are definitely you're here to garden on a Saturday at the garden center in October. <laughs> it's going to freeze next week. That says something about you all. Okay, that's a hardcore gardener. You want not a greenhouse grown mum, you want a field grown, a hardy garden mum. So they'll translate, they'll transfer, they'll, they'll plant better for you. So that's all we sell. They're a little bit smaller flowers, but they make up for it in, in quantity of flowers. These should come back for years and years and years to come. I've got some that are, I don't know how old they are, they're still going. What I do is I'll keep these upright and eventually, sometime in January, we'll get enough snow and moisture that it'll start to lay over. Um, or I've got some by the hot tub. You're in the hot tub and it's a little bit of wind coming and sometimes these, these petals will start to float inside the hot tub, which is unacceptable. Now let's clog up the filters. That's my cue and they start to lay down or they're, they're becoming weedy, trashy. I'll cut them off. By the end of February, first part of March, you're already starting to see new growth come up. I mean, they're one of the first ones to start growing. So I'll cut them back with a mower, weed whacker, whatever, hedgers, just get them down, and then they'll start coming back for you next. Usually by March 1, you're starting to see the moms start to come back. Not blooming, but the green growth. That's how you treat most of your perennials. Perennial grasses, perennial moms, echinaceas, gallardias, all those things you have, have out in the yard. Usually you'll start mowing those back, cutting them back, into February, March, somewhere in there. So that's a cue for, for pruning. Are your fruit trees, shade trees, evergreens, you're pruning those back, usually starting about January 1. That's when you want to prune. Don't go too early. Right now, the bugs are still out. The sap is still flowing in your plants. So you'll make a cut, exposes a wound, and now you can draw in some, some problems, possibly. If you wait until midwinter, the sap is locked in, the bugs are gone, and there's less likely to have uh, problems. Make sense? Trust me. Wait till wait till after the new, new year. Uh, into February, March. Well, when you want to then you'll have ugly flowers for a long time. Like I said, this big one, and they're starting to die off. Yeah. I, I want to cut them down a little bit because now wait, I'm going to have wait till wait okay. wait on just wait trust me it'll be better okay. it'll be better next spring and then fertilize it with more yeah I, that's one that would be better off with that uh, fruit and vegetable food oh really that formula would be better for a bloom, blooming thing uh, and it might keep it sturdier the formula is going to be hopefully give it a chunkier tighter fuller thicker well it was pretty full i just thought that the weight of the the monsoons i'm up in groom creek i mean it was heavy and i thought it was just smashing it so this one is hookra or your grandparents called it coral bells it's got a little flower that comes up has a little bell shaped flower to it but hookra is what you see it written up as this one i love in the fall of the year because it's a perennial comes back every year and it's got these great colors to the foliage. We've got them in greens, lime greens, purples, burgundies. There's a lot of different colors you can play with, and it comes back for years. So uh, this is one that you could easily plant some. Another thing too, for me, my main color this year, so we have, I'm a flower grower, I love flowers, that's my thing. I went dark, purples, is what the whole yard, I had a theme of purple. 
In the winter, those are all summer plants. I'm changing those out now, I'm going with lighter colors. Because the days are so short, these glow better, they show up better in the landscape in the winter. So when it's darker, and they also go really well with things like this. They just make things pop. From a designer standpoint, I'm thinking how to design with color, textures, and flowers. And so you took darker colors with lighter colors, they show better, but these just show up, lighter colors show up better. Okay. I just planted one of these in my yard. This is a succulent or euphorbia. This is a, a rainbow ascot euphorbia. This is an evergreen. It stays like this year round. Um, I've got one in the backyard that's like this big. It's glorious. It'll be glorious. January, February. Puts a little flower starting March, April. And it just has this great color. I just planted another one. Just, just I took one of these home yesterday, planted it in my front yard in one of my <coughs> containers. Uh, succulents do really well. You can plant these with, these are also evergreens. They're related. They're companion plants. This is a sedum. Sedum, this is as tall as it gets. And you can see what it does. It overflows the pots. So this will actually get three foot tendrils if you go down. But it's evergreen. So that's what I like about it. It's tough as nails. You can ignore this one. I mean, just abuse it, curse at it, kick dirt at it, and it still grows. It just is a great little succulent. Sedum. No, Sedum. The other one. Oh, this is this is a euphorbia. euphorbia. This is actually while we're on trivia. This is really how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Um, this is related to poinsettias. Poinsettia is a euphorbia family. Just this one's got a lot of antifreeze in it, so it doesn't freeze out in the winter, and it has a different color. But if you break off a stem. You'll see that same milky white, you know, when you pick off a, a poinsettia, you'll see that milky white sap to it. This has the same thing, which means that animals don't eat it. So javelina, pack rats, rabbits, deer, they do not bother this perennial. It's up about, I don't know, two, three feet, knee high or so. There's a good height for it. Is that or anything else there uh, invasive? Because I'm concerned about that. No. Okay. No invasive stuff. Not here. Uh, two things here. This is a perennial. This is one I just my personal favorites. What I have, I've always had these. This is uh, anytime you hear pinks, dianthus, or carnations, they're all kind of related. They're all the same family, and they all have this great foliage to it. Most of them are evergreen, and this is ever blue. Gets this nice mounding color to it. It'll have a crazy long bloom cycle. This will bloom to the end of the year. And it, then it hibernates for a bit by March 1. It's starting to be covered in blooms again. But I like it just for the green. It's not evergreen, ever blue. Whatever. I, I've got some foliage to inspire me out in the gardens, even though most of the perennials have died back. This one's still going. So it goes in containers, raised beds, wherever. Folks on Facebook, there you go. Yeah, Dianthus. Do they have to be deadheaded? They don't have to be deadheaded. I mean, you can. What I, that's a lot of work. Dead hennies work. I don't like work. With this, I let it go by itself. And then, but if, I, if I'm having you over as a dinner guest or party or birthday or whatever, that's when I go and deadhead and make sure everything. I'll do it two weeks prior. Here's the insider scoop. Here you go. Here's what I do. I, we love to entertain. Uh, two weeks before the event, whatever it is, Father's Day, all the dads are getting together. We're going to have a backyard barbecue. I want things to look good. My father-in-law, Harold Waters, he started the place. He is a gardener. He loves to look at your gardens. He likes to look at his gardens. He likes to judge your gardens. And I want to make sure my gardens look really good. So two weeks before the event, I deadhead things. And I fertilize with this flower power. This makes things, I could throw this hat on the ground. Give it flower power, and it will start to bloom. It's almost that good. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. We actually created this five or six years ago. We sell probably 1, 1,500 hanging baskets for Mother's Day. We sell a lot of hanging baskets. Gifty, it's, just, it's time to decorate. And about a month later, six weeks later, all those hanging baskets would just be green, no foliage, no flowers on the foliage. And so I'm going, this is a problem. People aren't fertilizing enough, or they're fertilizing with the wrong thing. So we created this to keep things blooming, to keep those flowers, specifically hanging baskets or containers, keep them in bloom. And it's a game changer. 
you're having trouble with keeping things blooming, especially containers or raised beds, that's the stuff. About two weeks prior, and things will just look magical. I mean, it just, it'll be full bloom. It really works, okay? Now, back to this. I could digress over and over and over again, so sorry about that. I love rabbit holes. This is uh, barberry. It's a great little hardy, tough as nail plant. A lot of these, uh, potent tea, I should have brought those. There's a yellow shrub as you go down to the lower greenhouse on your right-hand side. You'll see this pretty little shrub with yellow flowers all over it. They're summer-loving plants. They do great in the heat, surrounded by asphalt. I mean, just put them out there where the sun just radiates off a wall. These guys do really well. What I find is a lot of folks will plant those in the summer when it's really dry and you have less room for error with, with irrigation. And so if you plant these in the fall, I find you have better success because they'll get more roots on them before the heat of next summer and you'll have a more robust plant. That goes for potentia, barberries, a miniature of the Korean lilacs. They all do better with fall planting. So, but isn't that pretty? Just keep up, no maintenance. You never have to prune it. Just gets this tight little mound that's just easy to care for kind of plant. What else did I bring? This, this is an unusual plant, and I think we're down to it. This is a very unusual plant. You folks from California will love this, or the Northwest. This is camellia. Very, very few camellias grow here. There's really only two or three varieties that are hardy enough to winter over. It's all about winter coldness. They bred, this one will go down, I think, minus 20 degrees. It's one of the few that will actually winter over with us. It's evergreen, but, but you'll see it's loaded with little buds here. That's next spring's bud. So by the end of February, March, depends on the season, this will be in flower, have flowers about that big, just covering it. But if you've got uh, more of a shady area, not full sun, this is a great little plant to have it in the gardens. I'll let you clap. There you go. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in on Facebook.